Ellen Jones, president of the Wiggs Club Foundation. Uh, as you can see, we have a sellout uh, lunch today uh, in honor of our featured speaker, John Leahy of Airbus, who is uh, giving the annual site lecture for the Wings Club. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mary Ellen. Uh, I've prepared a speech here of about 35 minutes, but I think you actually summarized it in three or four, so we could go straight to the raffle if you want at this point, save a lot of time. No, actually, uh, I probably took this more seriously than I should have. Uh, I started writing uh, about the industry uh, and uh, with the help of a, a few researchers at Airbus, we came up with uh, a speech that uh, when I actually read it, ran to slightly over an hour. Uh, Mary Ellen talked me out of that, and my wife did too, so you can get the abbreviated version, but uh, if anyone wants to read the printed version, it actually does run that long. And, uh, you know, uh, Clay McConnell and some of our communications people uh, actually uh, put into the printed version, meaning cut out of what I'm going to say today, all the new product development stuff I was going to tell you about, so uh, you have to get the book. It's twenty ninety five. if you buy it now. Uh, I, I, I do get 10%, right, Mary Ellen? Okay. Anyway, uh, and I'm going to do something I char characteristically do not do, which is read, uh, if I can actually get my reading glasses to focus on this, uh, because I do want to keep it short. This will run about a half an hour for those of you who would want to pretend you're going to the restroom now and never come back, that is quite okay. You can get the full copy for 2095. Okay. Now, of course, I want to thank you all for being here and all that blah, blah. I think I'm on to the second page now. But the, uh, the site lecture, I was told, has to do with sight. Now, I couldn't quite figure out what that meant. Well, it's hindsight insight and foresight. Well, that was a, a tall, uh, you know, uh, agenda for me because the one thing I'm probably good at is hindsight. Being in this industry for 40 years, at least you get the benefit of hindsight. But uh, if I do weave through this presentation a discussion about how that hindsight of what's developed in this industry actually can lead to perhaps where we might be going as an industry in the future, uh, I'd appreciate your taking the time to actually focus on some of this. Uh, and I do know the food is good. In fact, uh, today I propose to talk about a remarkable, even historic development that's more or less coincided with my career over the past four decades, and which I believe still has a very long way to run. Of course, I'm talking about the revolution in commercial mass aviation. From the preserve of the economic elite in the 1970s, aviation has become a truly mass transportation industry, one which spans every corner of the globe and gives millions of people the chance to fly every day. So I'll begin by reflecting on some of the most important moments of the past 40 years, and uh, my wife and I sort of blended through that, uh, and uh, we can talk about where we were at the points when we were witnesses to history. But uh, we must also acknowledge that the expansion of commercial aviation is bringing challenges, uh, including congestion, and dare I say noise, and dare I say even a little bit of pollution. Now, we're not up there with cows yet, but uh, uh, we do add to the pollution of the world. And we can't just sit here in New York and pretend, well, that doesn't exist because we're so good we you know, fly people around the world. Let's uh, retrace our steps back down to 1970, the year that transformed aviation forever. What did the world look like in 1970? For context, the worldwide population stood at 3.6 billion people. I think we all know where it is today. Global GDP was 14 trillion. By the way, the US last year was uh, about 16 trillion. Think about the size of the world at that point in time. The worldwide middle class was 16% of the worldwide population. And here's one that shocks me. 50% of the world lived in poverty. 
Poverty is under $2 a day in constant dollars, purchasing parity index, which means you really are starving. Your kids are starving, 50% of the world. The global uh, airline fleet was 3,000 aircraft. About 1,600 of them were flying here in the United States. And uh, passenger RPKs, revenue passenger kilometers, were about half a trillion RPKs. Now that may sound like a really big number until you realize that we're 13 times bigger than that today. In India, one in a hundred people took a commercial aircraft flight. In China, there wasn't any commercial aircraft industry. Zero. If you were a politician or a, or a party uh, member, you might fly on a flight that was scheduled to take you and some others from one place to another, but there was no commercial industry. How safe was the industry? Well, we were doing about 1.6 fatal accidents per million uh, flights. And that's not perfect, we're doing a lot better today, but it was good enough that we could announce to the world then that the most dangerous part of your flight across the ocean was your drive to the airport, and we were right when we said it. But the reality was that taking a flight back in 1970 was a luxury. It was like living in a mansion or driving a Bentley. It was a luxury and a status symbol that was actually described as the jet set. Now, another aside, Mary Ellen, about New York. People in this industry wonder who ever coined the name Jet Set. The truth is, it was founded by the Journal American, a, a publication right here in uh, New York that is since out of business, which had nothing to do with the fact that I delivered newspapers for them back in, uh, in 1960 at age 10. But a guy called Knickerbocker wrote a column there, and he described the Jet Set. This is true because I read it on the internet. Anyway, the, uh, I did. I realized Wikipedia, actually, it was probably true. Uh, but the 747 arrived, and it changed everything. In January 1970, it began commercial operations for Pan Am from our good JFK over to London Heathrow. Now, the day before, they were flying a 707 with about 160 passengers in it. The next day, they brought in the 747 two and a half times as many passengers. To their enormous credit, my friends in Seattle built this great aircraft, and it did make flying more affordable and accessible to people around the world. Well, actually, you know, truth be told, they lost the C-5 competition to Lockheed, and one trip saw a real opportunity to make a freighter into a passenger aircraft. But be that as it may, Boeing succeeded magnificently with that aircraft. And as you mentioned before, Joe Sutter and his team of what they called the Incredibles will be forever revered in our industry, and rightly so. Well, in 1970, I was studying at Fordham University in New York City, and I can get rid of this paragraph because I think you already read it, uh, but to pay my way, I did drive that yellow taxi, and you learn an awful lot about life and passengers, uh, which, you know, is useful in the future when you drive a yellow cab in New York City. But uh, it was a bold decision to do something else at the time. While I was driving a cab, the European manufacturers were getting together and deciding that they needed to do something different. Because uh, in 1970, 204 airliners were delivered to the world. 177 of them were built here in America. So European manufacturers, the, some of the great guys who had actually built the uh, fighter aircraft of World War II decided, well, we need to do something about this, and they formed Airbus Industry. They built the world's first wide-body twin, and that's the one thing I, I do like about uh, Europe. Nobody ever asked for a wide-body twin, but they decided the world needed a wide-body twin. Now we're all flying them, and uh, they were ahead of the game. But they did start Airbus in 1970. Well, that's the past. Let's fast forward now 15 years. I'm just going to do a couple 15 years, so with a little bit of thought, you can see this won't take that long. I'll run out of time here. Let's 15 years to 1985 was the year I personally left Piper Aircraft 
And that was, uh, there's some people from Piper here, at least people who used to be with me at Piper Aircraft, and I think they'd admit that those were fun years. Seven and a half fun years of having brand new aircraft taken off the flight line to stay current, of course. Uh, they paid for the fuel to fly to the Hamptons, to fly from Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, uh, up to Bar Harbor, Maine to pick up some lobsters and come back to State College, Pennsylvania and you know, steam them up. It, it wasn't a bad job. I ended up uh, with 3,700 flying hours, mostly with uh, Piper aircraft. Uh, but in January 1985, I joined Airbus North America, right here in New York City, 34th floor of the Rockefeller Center International Building, that's the one across from St. Patrick's with uh, Atlas holding the, uh, the world up there. Well, the world economy had recovered from a recession, and in the Western world, the area of era of mass commercial aviation was now beginning to expand. Global demand for air travel had more than doubled since 1970. In fact, you'll see a pattern here. Every 15 years since the dawn of the jet age, air traffic has doubled and continues to double. Well, the world in 1985 was bigger. Population is now 4.8 billion compared to only 3.6, was also uh, a wealthier place with GDP having almost doubled to 27 billion. The middle class didn't move too much though, 16% in 1970, now it's 18%. And poverty, which was 50% of the world in 1970, goes down to 40%. Well, it's moving in the right direction, but with those numbers, you can see not an awful lot has changed. Uh, the world fleet of aircraft doubled up to about 6,500 aircraft, and safety was getting better. We moved down to 0.9 fatal accidents per million flights. So the industry had grown, but the story of expansion was still largely an American one. In 1985 was the first year when each American took one trip. Now, in 1985, I was an American. I took about 15 trips. So some people out in Wichita didn't take any, but it averaged out to about one per person. But in the rest of the world, the rest of the world, now this kind of Western Europe, Japan, Australia, the rest of the world combined was basically one person in five took a trip. And this is just 1985. In China now, they did actually get an aviation industry it's one in a hundred. So think about, that's just back in 1985. So why is air travel really concentrated here in the United States? Well, a critical factor was deregulation of the airlines back in 1978. That really helped drag this industry out of the doldrums. Remember the CAB? Some of you, I'm looking at the faces here, are, are pretty young, but some of the old guys like me do remember it. I remember being hired by Alan Boyd, the first Secretary of Transportation uh, uh, for the United States, and he was also chairman of the CAB, and he used to regale me with stories about how good it was, how organized it was, and it was. The most powerful people in an airline were the lawyers and the lobbyists, because you couldn't raise fares, you couldn't get a new route, unless you got the authorization of the government. This was run like a utility. And what are utilities known for, other than sending us out bills and never repairing the power lines on time? The fact is it's mediocrity. It was what it was. It was like the post office. Uh, it was like Chronopost, Grace, in, in France. But the consequences of regulation were far-reaching. With much tougher competition, many new carriers much lower airfares, and even, dare I say, bankruptcies. A lot of bankruptcies, but they were required to change the corporate structure. A lot of people around the world challenge whether Chapter 11 is fair. Well, it's fair compared to what? Compared to total liquidation? Then you don't have a transportation industry. Restructuring was required, and the Americans did a very good job through Chapter 11 of restructuring the aviation industry. Another thing we did <clears throat> was establishing the hub and spoke system. Nearly 40 years later, this strategy of hub and spoke remains immensely popular with many airlines and also become the linchpin of global long haul travel. You only have to look at how 
uh, Emirates, and uh, I got to see who's in the oh my God, uh, Ron's here. We don't want to mention Emirates in front of United, but uh, uh, Ron, it's one of those Far East carriers. But uh, of the Far East carriers, Emirates is one of the more professional. I must admit, uh, but Emirates has taken Dubai City out there in the desert and made it an international hub that actually has, and get this number right, I quadruple checked it, 150 A380 flights a day, seven days a week, going through Dubai, connecting, these people aren't going in and out of Dubai, they're connecting to the world. Well, in 1979, the U.S. began opening its borders to overseas competitors as well. The International Air Transportation Competition Act, which became Open Skies. Eventually, the first contract or deal bilateral was signed with the Netherlands in 1992. Another factor, which we shouldn't discount, was the rise of the lessors. Steve Hazy with ILFC, Tony Ryan, remember him? Everyone thinks of Ryanair. It was really... Uh, their, the father, uh, Tony Ryan, with GPA, that helped bring financing into the aviation market that otherwise was not available. That allowed airlines that never had access to new aircraft to have access to new aircraft through a lease structure. And uh, I think we owe them an awful lot to this, uh, to this very day. All of which means that uh, when I joined Airbus, as Mary Ellen said, in 1985, air travel was starting to ramp up its growth. I was also pretty lucky in another way. Airbus had recently made a decision that continues to make my job easier to this very day. They launched the A320, the company's first single-aisle aircraft. At the time, a lot of people questioned the wisdom of that move. After all, it seemed like an overcrowded corner of the market, thanks to the 727 being in the market, the 737 being in the market, the MD-80, even some old DC-9s being in the market. So in 1985, a common question among the experts, and we all have a lot of talking heads in this industry, me included, the experts said, does the world really need another 150-seat single-aisle aircraft? In fact, Airbus's initial goal was to manufacture about 700 of these aircraft. Well, my first Paris Air Show, I'd been with Piper at the Farnborough Air Show, but never at Paris. My first Paris Air Show was in 1985. So I show up in 1985. Everybody is laughing about this. This is going to be another Concorde, another European social program, there is no way that this little company with its fly-by-wire, single-aisle, 150-seat airplane is going to compete with the established majors in the marketplace. Well, no one's laughing now because uh, to date we've sold 12,700 in firm orders of that little airplane and delivered over 7,000 of those airplanes that the business case was supposed to be 700. What's so special about the A320 was that it marked the commercial introduction of fly-by-wire technology, which replaced manual flight controls with electronic systems. Fly-by-wire technology is now something that we take for granted and is a standard across the industry. We see it on all new and modern airplanes. But back in the 1980s, it represented a major breakthrough. This new technology didn't just mean the A320 had better flight controls, it also ensured that it was an aircraft that was lighter, more fuel efficient, easier to maintain, and it had a really cool side stick controller. And uh, I'm shocked that my competitors still insist that you have to have a wheel and a yoke, but uh, you know, some people are really died in tradition. Anyway, <coughs> safety is another very important part. We introduced flight envelope protection. You know, Scott and I were talking about angle of attack indicators on uh, light aircraft. You know, when I was at Piper, wow, that would have been really cool. You know, he's a flight instructor in the old days. Because anyone who moves up through commercial aviation ranks has to be a flight instructor these days, uh, those days. And you'd talk about accelerated maneuver stalls. You'd talk about, you know, different types of approach stalls. Yet, what you're really talking about was an angle of attack. All stalls are the same as the wing uh, loses the airflow over it, and they'll all look exactly the same way, no matter what the speed or condition of the airplane. We never had the ability 
to see that, to teach that. That should be on every airplane today. Well, anyway, this is important because the accident rate during this period starts coming down again. Between 1970 and 1985, the fatal accident rate goes down by 40%. Now, I can't say it's the uh, fly-by-wire because that came in in 88, but it was also the introduction of improved air traffic control, weather forecasting, better training, simulators, better governance and regulation. All of that combines to make this industry much safer. The upshot is that today the fatal accident rate has fallen to around 0.2 per million flights and that's compared to 0.5 in the year 2000. Remember, we were talking about 0.9 in 85 and 1.6 in 1970. They're, I know they're all very low numbers, but think about that in terms of percentage reduction in fatal accidents. The record of continuous improvement over the decades has, of course, been a collective achievement for the entire industry, from the manufacturers to the airlines and the regulators. Here in the present day, I'm delighted to see such a strong commitment across the sector as a whole. We're all becoming safer, and the one thing we all should do together is never, ever compete on the issue of safety. This is one thing that we work together on, and that's one of the reasons why I think this is the safest way to move yourself from point A to point B that has ever been invented. Well, let's move again to the year 2000, another 15 years. What's going to happen? Air traffic is going to double. RPKs are going to be more than double. We're now in the world over 6 billion people. Worldwide GDP is now up to 50 trillion US dollars. These are all in constant dollars, by the way, uh, not current. The middle class is now up to 26%. Okay, it's moving up. And of course, only 30% of the people in the world are living in poverty. 30% up from 50% in 1970, not too bad. Uh, meanwhile, world demand for air travel has again doubled. The number of RPKs was more than twice what it was 15 years earlier. It's now 3.5 trillion, and one in 20 people in China are now flying every year. But regrettably, only one in 50, this by the way, the year 2000, only one in 50 in India are actually getting on an airplane. In half a day in India, more people would take the train that would fly on an airplane in the entire year in terms of volume of traffic. The passenger fleet was up to about 12,000 aircraft and safety, as I said before, the rate's improving. For my part now, in 1994, I moved over to France to, to head up Airbus commercial operations and Grace and my children uh, came shortly thereafter. Uh, it really was shortly. I think Grace would have preferred to stay in the States a little bit longer, but uh, she came shortly thereafter. Four years later, by the way, uh, when I got there in 94, as uh, Mary Ellen had said, I had a brilliant idea at my sales symposium in, in 1995 to set a goal that Airbus would have 50% of the commercial aircraft market by the turn of the millennium, the year 2000. Well, the industry laughed, some of my colleagues in Seattle laughed rather loudly and publicly, and uh, we ended the year 1995 at 18%, so they probably had a point in, in laughing. Uh, the good news is I worked for a European company. Had I worked for an American company, I'd be back in 1996 driving a yellow cab in New York City. But uh, as I was with a European company, they said, okay, John, what's your goal for next year? And I said, 50%. And then they laughed, and that was the board. I said, no, no, we're, we're gonna get there. It's gonna take a while. Well, we got there in 1999, we got to 50% of the market. We've essentially kept it every year since then. Not every year, it bounces back and forth. But seven out of the last 10 years, we uh, were over 50% outselling my friends in Seattle. But Mary Ellen, I don't really count this. This is just a, a random number they came up with, but it's true. Anyway, there's another phenomenon that's affecting how this market is changing. And that's the era of the low-cost carriers. They're expanding across America. 
Southwest Airlines had been launched back in 1971 in the U.S. as the first low-cost carrier, and such airlines had prospered here in the 1980s by prioritizing, of course, we know that, low fares, single classes, uh, you get what you get, and you get what you pay for. But in the 1990s, the low-cost airlines also began to arrive in new markets around the world. Europe had followed in the footsteps of the U.S. by liberalizing its commercial aviation market, culminating in the creation of the single aviation market in the EU. Not that easy to do, but they finally pulled it off. That set the stage for innovation and experimentation, new players. Ever hear of Ryanair? Ever hear of EasyJet? They were unheard of back about 20 years ago, and now they're major players in the European market. Since then, low-cost carriers have spread out across Asia, Latin America, and now even in Africa. Well, the African one isn't doing that well at the moment, but uh, they'll get there. That's because at the turn of the millennium was also a time when economic growth in emerging economies reached a tipping point. And I really believe this. Around the year 2000, we hit a tipping point in the world economy. Growth in the advanced economies was relatively subdued. Some even said on CNBC, stagnating. But in India, China, and the other emerging economies, it was a different story. People were joining the middle classes in flying in even greater numbers. People had disposable income. So here we are, post-2000. Indeed, since the millennium, the pace of change has been remarkable. 15 years later, 2015, the, oh, around 2016, the world's population is now 7.4 billion people. Global GDP is more than 76 trillion. Remember, it was 15 trillion back in 1970. Middle class now accounts for 40%. 40% of the world. Poverty, world average, is now down to 10%. That's amazing. Now, we as an industry didn't do it, but the economy and a lot of other social programs actually did it. But think of that combination of 7.4 billion people. The middle class is now up to 40% of that number, and poverty, poor people don't fly in airplanes, is now down to only 10% of the world. Air travel has doubled again since the year 2000. So the number of RPKs now stands at more than 6.5 trillion. That's 13 times what it was back in 1970. The US and Europe, every person now takes almost two trips a year on commercial aircraft. And hundreds of millions of people in the emerging economies are taking to the skies for the first time. In China, one in three people, one in three, now takes a trip every year. India is now about 1 in 12. The aircraft passenger fleet has grown to 18,000. And safety is better than ever. 0 0.2 fatal accidents per million flights. What's exciting especially for our younger colleagues is this chapter of growth is just beginning. At Airbus, we publish an annual global market forecast which explores how air travel might evolve over the next two decades. It shows that worldwide demand for air travel will continue to increase, fueled by rising wealth and the emerging economies growing around the world. In another 15 years, there'll be more than 8.4 billion people in the world. Global GDP should be up to about 115 uh, trillion. The global middle class will now be over 50% of the world population. Poverty will be obviously much less than 10%. In fact, in 2030, more than half of the world's population will be in the middle class. That's 4.3 billion people able to spend money flying on aircraft. The implications for global air travel will be striking. Overall demand is expected to double. China will grow to about one trip per person per year just 15 years from now. There's 1.3 billion people in China. Every one of them will take, on average, one trip a year. The number one market in the world today is US domestic air travel. 
the number one market in the world in 15 years will be China domestic air travel. All this is likely to create a worldwide demand for more than 23,000 new commercial aircraft over the next 15 years. So that by the year 2030, the overall size of the world fleet will be about 32,000 aircraft. Now, some people question whether such optimistic forecasts are realistic. But commercial aviation has proven itself to be remarkably resilient throughout the past four decades. Air traffic has continued to double every 15 years despite the oil crises. And we had several of them in the 1970s. The Gulf War, we had several of those too in the 1990s, the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, September 11th attacks here in New York City, the SARS outbreak, and the global financial crisis of 2008. Despite all of that, air traffic through that period has doubled every 15 years. The equation is really very simple. It's being driven by the economic wealth that used to be concentrated in America, and then later in Western Europe and Japan, now moving throughout the world. The simple truth is that people do love to travel if they get the money to do so. Now, Homo sapiens were sort of concentrated in equatorial Africa about 130,000 years ago, and they got the urge to travel. Otherwise, we'd all be eating fruits and vegetables here today and not needing aircraft. People given resources disposable income will travel. They get on airplanes. And that makes the uh, emergence of another frontier in commercial aviation even more exciting. Africa. Our industry has barely begun to tap this continent's enormous potential. It accounts for 3% of global traffic despite having a population larger than North America, Central America, and South America combined. The average number of trips per person in Africa is about one-fifth of what it is in China today, not much more than it was 30 years ago. Every American European, as I said, takes about uh, two trips per year in an aircraft. In Africa, it's one in 15 people take a trip in an airplane. Now consider that the continent's population is likely to double over the next 30 years and become, of course, better educated, more urban, with a growing middle class healthier, and more disposable income, all of which means that Africa will certainly follow in the footsteps of Asia and Latin America by becoming a major aviation marketplace. By uh, the year 2030, some say that Africa will still only account for 3%, maybe up to 5% of global air traffic, less than 4% of the world's commercial aircraft fleet. Well, I say they're wrong, and some of them are Airbus forecasters, too, because we as an industry always get inflection points wrong when we forecast. When I came to Europe in 1994, the forecast was that India would not need more than 200 new aircraft in the next 20 years. We well, see orders from Indigo and others for way more than that. This industry and most industries in forecasting get the inflection points wrong. The idea is to figure out where they're most likely to occur and move forward with that. Well, what will be uh, some of the broader implications of such enormous growth for our industry? It's clear that the next 15 years will be an era of great opportunity for all of us, whether we're the manufacturers, whether we're the airlines, whether we're the lessors. I mentioned that there was a demand for more than 23,000 aircraft over the next 15 years. I didn't mention that those aircraft would be worth about 3.7 trillion US dollars. Well, at catalog price. Uh, Boeing doesn't always sell at catalog price. Uh, <laughs> take the Fifth Amendment on whether I do. But I'm at a risk of making it all sound way too easy. And one thing we all know in this room is that commercial aviation is never easy just as there's never been room for complacency ever. After all, billions of passengers entrust us with their personal safety every year. We must continue to do our utmost to repay that trust every day. It'll still be as true in 15 years as it is now. We must also recognize that the industry's expansion is generating 
major challenges. One is congestion throughout the global aviation network. Some countries are struggling to build enough new airports and runways to keep up with demand, partly due to public uh, opposition. Uh, some countries and cities like New York City, London, are sort of hoping against hope that they'll find a way, but they're not building any infrastructure. Well, there are 55 cities in the world that this day handle more than 10,000 international passengers, 55. 47 of them are already congested. Now, some countries are doing something about it. No, it's not the UK and it's not the US. China, in its new five-year plan, starting now, will produce 66 new international commercial airports, international capable commercial airports between now and the year 2020. 66, that's actually a five-year plan. That's more than one new international jet-capable commercial airport a month going forward. That's one of the reasons why domestic China traffic will be number one in the world in 15 years. To prevent skill shortages, though, this uh, industry needs to train more people. We need about 20,000 new pilots every year, starting in 2019 and going forward. And uh, some of us in this room, like me and our friends at Piper, used to do the thing about starting out uh, and getting your private, commercial, multi-engine instrument flight instructor, then go <laughs> bore holes through the sky, teaching people to fly for 1,500, 2,000 hours, then try to get a job in a commuter airline, then after the commuter airline trains you, then go to the major as fast as you can. That isn't necessarily the best way to train people going forward. We have to look into that. Our industry must also face up to tougher environmental standards amid mounting public concern about emissions and aircraft noise. At the same time, the competition is becoming tougher. Airline manufacturers and airports are all fighting to win the largest possible share of the growing demand for air travel around the world. And let's not forget our passengers. In the social media today, they're more powerful than they ever were. They can now use websites such as TripAdvisor, SeatGuru, and others to plan their journeys, look for fares, and to rank and assess airlines and aircraft, by the way, in real time, even while they're sitting on the airplane. That's throwing a harsh spotlight on passenger comfort and customer service. But not everyone in the industry has woken up to this fact yet. For those of you who were here last year, I think Barry persuaded one of the titans of the industry, uh, Robert Crandall, Bob Crandall, to come in and give a lecture. So I took the liberty of, of watching it uh, on the internet, on your website. It was very interesting. Bob described the airline's misguided attempt in one of the segments to please legions of what he called, quote, deeply dissatisfied customers. Well, at least Bob got the fact right that they didn't like being in the airplanes. He said that, uh, introducing wider seats and other efforts to improve customer satisfaction always turned out to be a waste of time. Passengers, he said, only really focused on ticket prices. They didn't care about what plane they flew in, whether where they sat in that airplane, or how, how comfortable they were. So my message today is, Mr. Crandall, tear down that wall. That concept is boxing in this industry. People do care. But think about it 30 years ago. You bought a ticket. You didn't know which airplane was coming up at the gate. You certainly didn't know what LOPA it had. You didn't know what seat pitch it had, what the layout would be. People do care if given a chance. And with the social media we have today, they have that chance. Why do you think we have premium economy bursting on the scene? people are willing to pay more to get a little bit better service than they otherwise would. Yes, they might check prices first, but then after they figure out, okay, that's a good price, now let me see, for a little bit more, what can I get? That's gonna be the wave of the future going forward, and it's not gonna change. So, these are the forces that will continue to reshape the commercial aviation sector in the coming years. But how should we as an industry respond? Our first priority must be to continue to drive advances in aircraft design, technology, and reliability. Dispatch reliability must be 99.9%, if not higher, technical dispatch uh, reliability. 
I'm not accounting for whether the pilot showed up sick or not, but technical dispatch reliability must be 99.9% .9 and higher. At Airbus, we must produce aircraft that help the airlines and the lessors, our customers, to be more successful. And that means not aircraft that are efficient and reliable, but aircraft that hold their value going forward. A great example is the A350, our latest wide-body jet. It delivers a 25% reduction in fuel consumption and CO2 emissions compared to previous generation of airliners while flying at higher cruise speeds, offering wider seats, and a big one for me, lower cabin altitude and fresher cabin air. A major reason for the A350's efficiency is it's the first Airbus aircraft to be built with lightweight composite fuselage and wings. The newest aircraft acquired are two. Look at our A320neo, which is an absolutely great airplane if Mary Ellen would only give us engines. This is uh, Airbus, the new single aisle, that was just an aside, which isn't in the formal remarks. Uh, it began commercial operations just a little while ago, and uh, people are very happy with it. It reduces fuel consumption by 15%. Good point. But what a lot of people don't know is the noise footprint it makes around an airport, either departing or landing, is reduced by over 50%. It is much, much quieter. And we all know how noise impacts community relations. There's also a stronger focus on passenger comfort in the newest generation of aircraft, reflecting those rising passenger expectations. But the reality is, that a successful commercial aviation sector will also be one that can keep pace with a sharply rising demand for air travel. So a second priority for our industry must be to deliver an enormous expansion of the global aviation infrastructure. Right now, London is the only city in the world that handles more than 120,000 long haul passengers a day. Grace and I were there last night and we can both assure you that the experience was awful. <laughs> it really was. It jammed onto a bus, people bumping into each other, uh, and, and we were flying first class. So imagine what it would be like uh, the other way around. No, it's, we can do better as an industry than that. In two decades time, by the way, there will be seven such cities as London is today. That's in 20 years time. Well, at the same time, aerospace manufacturers must keep an eye on the very distant future and pursue the bold innovations that might one day reshape, reshape commercial aviation, just as the 747 and the A320 did over the last years. So our third and final priority for the industry is to develop the next generation of aircraft that will appear in the 2030s and beyond. And most of this are people took out of my presentation so it wouldn't appear in the New York Times tomorrow. But uh, I'll give you the key points. Our industry is a proud tradition of innovation. Since the dawn of the jet age in the 1950s, we have reduced typical passenger jets fuel consumption and CO2 emissions by 80%. That's right, A320 compared to the old 727, both about 150 seaters, and noise by about 75%. Our goal must be to make equally impressive uh, leaps forward over the next half a century as we go forward. The calls for investment and research and development are key. At Airbus, we invest, and I know our CFO is upset about this, we invest more than 2 billion euros every year in R&D. 2 billion euros a year at Airbus in research and development. And I'm confident this investment will continue to bear fruit in the years ahead. In 15 years time, we might see the launch of Airbus's new, all new single aisle aircraft. It'll be even lighter, quieter, more fuel efficient, the A320, and it'll build using a higher portion of carbon. It won't be fly by wire, it'll probably be fly by light using fiber optics. And it will most likely have a new unducted fan engine, which no doubt will be delivered late by the engine manufacturers. <laughs> Manufacturers are also studying more far-reaching innovations, including electric engines, really. Electric engines, electric taxiing. Wings can still be longer and slimmer than they are today. Uh, some manufacturers even think the wave of the future is folding them. We'll see if that works out. For my part, 
In the mid-1940s, Grace and I are planning to be on the first commercial flight of the new supersonic aircraft. We've already reserved our seats. I can assure you it'll be quiet, no sonic boom. It'll be fuel efficient and it will make money. And I have no doubt that our industry will remain a hotbed of technological innovation and ingenuity and an incredibly exciting place to work for engineers and aircraft salesmen alike. Increasingly, the focus of that innovation will be on ensuring that commercial aviation doesn't just grow, but it also remains an overwhelmingly positive force for good in the world today. Organizations like the Wings Club will have a crucial role to play in achieving these twin goals by ensuring that as, a, as an industry, we can tackle our shared challenges together. After all, it's only by working together that we will safeguard commercial aviation's outstanding safety record and preserve an adequate stock of technical and professional skills in aviation to ease congestion in the world's skies and to have us all fly more safely and quickly and efficiently around the world. So let me first thank the Wings Club here for all of your efforts in promoting and the advancement of aviation over the last 74 years. And it is not true that I was at the first meeting. It's about the 10th meeting. Uh, your work will only become more important as commercial aviation strives to retain public and political support as it expands. We're visible, we will always be attacked. And I'll leave you with one final thought about why that matters. Over my career, I've been fortunate enough to see commercial aviation follow in the footsteps of the automobile sector becoming a truly mass transportation industry. And if you think about it, <clears throat> about 100 years ago, and it's really back only to about 100 years ago, transportation by car was for the few. 8% of the people in the world in the early 20th century had, 8% of the people in the United States, families, had access to an automobile. They probably called themselves the car set, like the jet set or something like that. But then in the year 1908, Henry Ford changed everything. It became mass transportation. They built the vehicles, they made it economical, and everybody wanted to travel. We're doing the same thing now. It was once the prerogative of the jet set. Now aviation is truly mass transportation. We did it over the last 100 years. It's been an impressive show. In fact, if you go back to 1970, it's been enormously impressive just since then. Imagine what the next 40 or so years are gonna look like. Together, we are going to change the world. Thanks. Thank you for your appearance here today. Thank um, you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. much for coming. Okay. okay. We need to get